Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to ISCM Forums, a very unique and a very interesting series of town halls on technology in supply chain management. Uh, before I get on to the events of the day, I would like to familiarize yourself, you with uh, the Institute of Supply Chain Management and the ISCM Forums. Uh, as many of you know, the Institute of Supply Chain Management is an education, research, training, and consulting organization focusing on all aspects of supply chain, uh, starting from planning right down to sourcing, transportation, warehousing, and the overall supply chain uh, elements. The Institute of Supply Chain Management is an inherent part of how corporates in India would shape their supply chains. We organize a series of very interesting training programs and certifications, and you can visit our website, www.iscmindia.in in for further details of it. The Institute also has a forums division, which we have rechristened as ISCM forums. ISCM forums is only thought leadership forum in the country, which is focused on bringing you cutting edge and uh, expert dialogues on a variety of issues within supply chain management. What sets us apart <clears throat> incisive and uh, deep exploration into concepts within the supply chain management. With a brief introduction of ISCM and ISCM forums, I would now like to move on to today's uh, event, which is the supply chain, mon uh, supply chain management technology series, which is starting with the block with blockchains. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the uh, let me thank CoinEarth for having come forward to partner us with this uh, blockchain event. Technology, the supply chain technology town hall series is a series of five separate town halls we will have on various issues that uh, pertain to technology and supply chain management. We are kicking off the series with blockchain, a very interesting technology, but something that has uh, led to more confusion than clarity. Now, one of the biggest problems in supply chain, as all of us who are practitioners know, is a lack of open and trustworthy information across the chain. A lot of issues there. Some of them are technology, some of them are legit legacy practices, right? Uh, if you look at our supply chain, our supply chains are nothing else but a series of bilateral contracts between two entities in the chain, which are all coming together to create the industry uh, supply chain. However, what happens is that as we move from one contract to other, there's a lot of information flow that creates, uh, that, that gets blocked, leading to probably gaps in uh, information Probably there is a reduced trust and probably also due to gaps in technology. Now, when these things happen, our supply chains tend to get inefficient. They tend to get uh, uh, more uh, opaque. So today to start the series, we are look, examining one such technology which shows promise and that is blockchain. We will be starting the series with a uh, Team addressed by Dr. Rakesh Singh, Chairman of the Institute of Supply Chain Management. Dr. Rakesh Singh does not need any uh, introduction to uh, people who are familiar with the Institute and with uh, supply chain management. He's a, a author, he's a, a commentator, and an expert in various aspects of supply chain, including planning and technology. I would like to invite Dr. Rakesh Singh today uh, to deliver the theme address on blockchain in supply chain management. Dr. Rakesh Singh, over to you. Thank you, Girish. Thank you, Girish. And I welcome all of you to the technology supply chain series of the Institute of Supply Chain Forums. 
And as Greece rightly said, we are providing this thought leadership forums in terms of understanding the larger dimensions of supply chain, where technology remains a part of it. Technology is today transforming everything, including the businesses, their strategies, and their supply chains. And I think supply chains have actually acquired a very strong meaning in the sense that if you see a lot of writings today, they say that businesses compete on the basis of their supply chains. And uh, come pandemic, that has been uh, you know, empirical evidence of it, that businesses need their supply chain to run the lifeline of businesses. Going into the domain of blockchain, I think I picked up this from a Harvard Business School article, but it talks about the larger uh, you know, feeling about what the supply chain domain is all about and how blockchain can transform it. But there are a lot of hype and the reason to those hype that are given. The first one is that we all have heard about blockchain will revolutionize business, but it's going to take a lot longer than many people claim. Many people claim, like TCP IP on which the internet was built, blockchain is a foundational technology that will require broad coordination. The level of complexity, technological, regulatory, and social will be unprecedented. I think these are very valid uh, hypes. And one of the important element of understanding these hypes are that the supply chains themselves have lived into their ecosystems, which are very difficult and hard to break alone by technology. They are largely behavioral and the change management is an important process of bringing this overlaying of technological solutions and solutions that can bring huge amount of lifeline into the business. And hence the truth is that adoption of blockchain will follow a fairly predictable path while the journey will take years, it's not too early for businesses to start planning. And I think this is the kind of things that we have been actually seeing that there's a lot of talk about blockchains, but this hype of blockchain is foundational and will take a long period of time, is pushing businesses further away from not even trying to experiment and understand and start the process of implementation. It's not too early for them to start planning, planning for this transition. And this particular blockchain town hall has been curated with the help of Coin Earth, primarily to drive home this point that it is the time now that blockchains, based supply chains can be given a try and they could be a basis of large amount of truth, truth as it is in the supply chain. The lies in the supply chain have been creating amazing amount of problem. And if you see, you know, what else supply chain today, this is a very traditional problem, bullwhips everywhere. What is this bullwhip? Why everywhere do we have bullwhips? What are the reasons for these bullwhips? And why bother about this bullwhips? And in fact, if I just go and see, here is a very classic case, very old case, a very celebrated Barilla case, which I love. Here it says that the mean demand for pasta is 300, standard deviation is 227. When the average demand is 300, a company is having 850, 760, 430, 510, 650, 598. Over the years, 29 to 30 weeks, the orders are much above the, uh, the mean and leading to a huge fluctuation from the mean or deviation from the mean. And all of us know, all you know, supply chain colleagues here would know that the safety stock is going to be if you're 99% service level, that's what supply chain is all about. You would have huge amount of inventory in the supply chain. 
This is called technically a complete bullet problem, but this bullet problem does not exist alone in the supply chain. If I look at the end-to-end -end supply chain, the talk is about end-to-end -end supply chain now, we have never operated in end-to-end -end supply chain. If I say that I can divide the block into so many other blocks, but here are the four blocks and the fifth one is a kind of a story of all the blocks. Exploding the bill of material, what's our supply chain? Every production process needs material resource planning where we create bill of material, this bill of materials have, bill of material have, bill of material, depending upon industry, there could be 50,000 tiles of, uh, you know, supplies leading to a huge amount of complexity in the purchasing organization and, and complexity from purchasing to the uh, material resource planning and to the production and planning and this thing. That is what of supply chain from where is another question within that. Organization and supply chain, who are, supply, who are these organizations? Where are they located? If you find that there are 50,000 uh, tire of suppliers and you don't know where they're located, you are dead. There, is, there can be no single truth of a businesses to use that as a data to align supply chain. The where of the supply chain in terms of locations, manufacturing, servicing location and even outlets of the largest uh, sanity shop in rural village in India, this could be in complete complexity and there could be something. Going with the flows, how things move, how materials move, blindly, how goods move, blindly, how money moves in a distorted manner. And I think supply chains have been plagued with this particular problem right since the start of uh, supply chains. And when MRP came into being in 1970s, I think we created too much lead time for the longer supply chain creating bullwhip. So, uh, you know, look at the pandemic. There is a supply bullwhip now. Supplies are not available. The global supply chain is distorted. I think whatever we have done to bring transparency into the supply chain by building even technology, the initiatives have not been good enough and distortion have been too rampant too fast and without the alternative modes of transportation and lanes and channel canals required, it has distorted the whole thing. What is happening? There is a demand bullwhip now. The world is growing today. If you see the economic times, uh, the, uh, the, after two years, this has been the finest growth in the Indian businesses saying that the demand is going to go up. And when talking to all my uh, supply chain friends, they say that where is the supply and we are going to face huge shortages of supply is a shortage a bullwhip of the negative kind from the supplies to a bullwhip of demand where supplies cannot meet leading to which which markets are you going to really uh, supply so it's going to be a situation like this where there will be huge fluctuations you don't know what lies where which market is demanding what where or is where from which market the supplies are going to come there is a complete blinded supply chain. So each one in a blinded supply chain, and traditionally this has been made this way. If you look at a, a supply chain from retailers to wholesaler, distributor to factory to supplier, you see that every fold and level of supply chain operates in its own sphere of influence. And it's a blind supply chain. What happens? Everybody whips the order above the supply chain, creating huge kind of what I called it here as the most disturbing terms called story of inventory. Why does inventory lie everywhere? I mean, why does inventory lie in some places where there's no need and why there's a stock out when there is a need? Because you do not have the required transparent data. And I think this has been amazing story of supply chains in even the recent years with the rise of the APOs. We thought APOs will be able to do away with it. But I think APOs blinded everybody in terms of algorithm. They could not provide that particular solution. And they also could not work well when they did that because organizations work in marketing, in sales, in finance. And finance has a currency view. Uh, supply chain has a service view, sales has a pipeline view. We don't harmonize, synchronize, and align these views. And hence, the story of inventory is amazing to see in supply chains. So how does blockchain provide that particular hope? I'm not no more no expert on blockchain, but I think I understand the need for blockchain. I understand its basic architecture. 
I know it's a foundational technology. I know it has to break a huge number of legacy system. It has to work on the change management first and the technology overlaying second. And I think this cannot be forgotten given the history of you know, evolution of technologies and adoption of technologies in organizations. So, you know, what does platform uh, uh, blockchain does? It builds platforms where companies can collaborate. I think you will hear from Sachin uh, how IBM and Merck have launched trade lanes for managing global shipment involving multiple stakeholders, single source of truth. That is, you create a platform that becomes a single source of truth. And how does that happen? <laughs> How does that happen? Because you use the principles of blockchain. I'm going to talk about those principles of blockchain in just two minutes. Sorry. For this. Blockchain can simplify partnership. If you see this diagram, you know, this is from the Barilla annual reports when they identified and they wanted to have Vietnam man his inventory. As a change management exercise. I'm very clear about that. Now, if you look at factory from retailer to wholesaler to distributor to factory, you find that all on the other side, how they whip the bull. If the demand is X, he says X plus 20% of X. Then the wholesaler says X plus 50% of X. Distributor says X plus 80% of X. Factory orders built some material on the basis of X plus X and then X plus 20 into the tires and it goes on to the 50 tires. Automobile, it can become 4X. A demand of X, servicing 4X, lying so much inventory into the organization. And this is where I think one of the fundamental change that black, uh, platforms can bring is to build the partnership between them. Why? The first element is to see that everyone sees the X. Everybody is seeing a different number. There is a huge asymmetry in information. The transaction cost is amazingly high. Not only transaction cost, the coordination cost within transaction cost is so, so much high. And it has a huge, huge implication for organization. Then it politicizes the marketing and sales against the operations and operations against the uh, marketing and sales. And this political boundary creates an amazing amount of bullwhip effect in the organization, creating distortion and locking up working capital and distorting the finances. And this is why blockchain provides that framework. And that framework is very simple. What is blockchain? I think everyone of here as a student of uh, supply chain technology and blockchain would know this. Each party on a blockchain has access to the entire database and its complete history. No single party controls the data or the information. It's a distributed database. Unlike in the traditional supply chain, which we operate today, the data is operated at the different eclions of the supply chain. Everyone puts in his biases in the data and then the order moves the supply chain. In fact, there's a DDMRP group which says that the orders are amazingly truth of the market. I think they need to reevaluate. If you look at the Indian distribution channel, they are not the truth of the market. Or any developing countries, even in developed countries, you see that there is a huge bull whipping of the supply chain. It's a peer-to-peer -peer transmission. Communication occurs directly between peers instead of through central node. Each node stores and forward information to all the other nodes. And hence, there's a huge transaction of information. Transparency with pseudonymity, which means that every transaction and its associate value are visible to anyone with access to the system. Irreversibility of record. Once a transaction is entered in the database and the accounts are updated, the records cannot be altered because they are linked to every transaction record that come after them and hence the term chain. This particular reversibility of record is a great advantage of the blockchain technology because when you have this, then the layers, each and every layer will be forced to give the true number. And if each and every layer provides the true numbers, what they think true, I think supply chain will go beyond blockchains for sure. But they will bring a complete transparency into the layers of supply chain 
which each partner seeing the same schedules and part. And if you see the same schedule and part, that brings an amazing amount of transparency. And I think it will pave way for transparency. In fact, this along with all the digital initiative and sensors and automation and data and analytics would become a very true source of understanding the data which the system generates, data that lies into the geography of the organization, and data that emerges from the ecosystem. And they all provide a huge amount of computational logic and where data can be used in a brilliant way using MIAL and other things to make decisions. This is even MIAL imposed on blockchain with a lot of outside in data, which we are talking about in planning and supply chain alignment, and even talking about the macroeconomics data and the global data with the stocks, which you know a blockchain cannot capture, would be able to capture, predict, and simulate in a terms of what is called as sensing. And just not demand sensing, it could be supply and demand sensing, and that could also give a great intelligence to your predictability and your planning for the short-term tactical horizon where your sales and operation planning and IBP can bring that change. And this is why it is very important to understand. As I come to the conclusion of my talk, I think there are two things with blockchain which are important to be understood. This is purely my view. And I have borrowed from understanding of my readings from various literature. As I said, I'm no more uh, no blockchain expert, but history suggests that two dimensions that affect how a foundational technology use cases evolve is first novelty, the degree to which the application is new to the world, the more novel it is, more effort it will require. And I think uh, some of my friends in the blockchain uh, service uh, uh, provisions uh, domain are finding this, but I think it is something that solves the second complexity, which is represented by the level of ecosystem coordination involved. And if the level of ecosystem coordination involved created bullwhip effect, believe me, maybe the novelty and the whole foundational technology uh, dilemma of adoption in the long run may take a very different turn. So if the benefits can be seen and organizations can evolve and if the blockchain required technological support uh, you know, emerges and evolves, I think it will become a reality. And this is why I think despite it being a foundational technology, it, it along with all digital transformation that is taking place, including the uh, outside in approaches from a change management perspective and a very robust, sales and operation planning because partnership happened there and sales and operation planning and integrated business planning would help you in order to build this chain. Look at the complexity in this chain. Every node sees the same schedules and part and every node's schedules and parts are visible to everybody and there's no irreversibility of the record. There is no bullwhip. And hence, it leads to a great amount of partnership because it, it breaks the politics of organization. And as it breaks the politics of organization, collaboration becomes very important. But I think technology enthusiasts should be also taking note that it is behavioral and organizational factors that needs to be aligned to technological factors to make a great organization, which is in fact based on partnership, based on collaboration and Hence, blockchain will be able to enhance trust, efficiency, and speed, and paving way for truly an end-to-end -end synchronization and harmonization of functional areas leading to a connected supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakesh Singh. Um, it was indeed, uh, it, set, it has set the tone for the discussions uh, that will follow today. Thank you. Good. From understanding uh, how blockchain being a foundational technology and the challenges that organizations face in create in using this foundational technology to create the kind of advantages that we need in our supply chains and businesses. We will now start with our uh, first team discussion. Uh, we will start with a theme discussion on understanding what is a blockchain and where does it fit in a supply chain. To discuss this with me, I have 
Sachin Bhanushali, Director and CEO, Gateway Rail Freight. I have Yepi Kobero, Global Product Herd at NERSC. I have Mehrair Patel, Group's Chief Information Officer, Digital Solutions at Gina and Company. Harry Lagarde, Regional Director, Integrated Logistics, APAC from Geodis. And Dr. Praful Chandra, Founder and CEO of CoinEarth. I also thank uh, CoinEarth for being a technology partner and lending us your uh, insights to make this event even better a success. Today, as we, uh, to give you a brief on the way we will proceed, this is going to be a free flow discussion. Uh, we will exchange ideas, we will exchange our positions and views uh, on a variety of subjects which depend upon how blockchain fits into a supply chain. I will also request all my audience to keep your, keep posting your questions uh, in, your, in the chat, which is available to you. Once we get the questions, we will be passing it on to the relevant uh, speaker so that they can address those questions. As Dr. Rakesh Singh has said, yet another day and yet another new technology. Today we are discussing blockchain. For a long time, at least for the last three to four years, I have been hearing that blockchain has the potential to change the business environment. It has the potential to increase the profitability of most businesses and also challenge the business models as we know it. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is, does blockchain really apply to supply chain world? Can it solve our supply chain problems and increase profitability? Very practical questions. And as most of us know, in supply chain today, we have data and we have good data. And we are also able to communicate this data across supply chain at almost real time as possible. Then what are the processes? What are the problems? One are slow manual processes. Yes, our supply chains can handle large complex data sets, but behind those data sets are manual processes and therefore they will uh, reduce the speed of our transactions. Second, traceability. Thanks to COVID, one of the biggest benefits that I would see from COVID is that it has put visibility on the platter of almost all uh, boards. And once visibility comes in, uh, blockchain is one of the foundational technologies which can bring in the kind of visibility that we want and also traceability, not just visibility, but also traceability. And the third, it has the potential to reduce supply chain and IT transaction costs. There are huge amount of potential and to discuss them, I have my eminent panel with me. Uh, as I said, we are going to have a free flow discussion uh, and uh, hence to start off, uh, probably I should uh, start off with the two gentlemen who are a part of the operative part of the supply chain, Harry and uh, Meharaj. So I could probably invite Harry first. Harry, if you could uh, uh, give us your view and your opinion on how supply chains, how blockchains fit into our supply chain and what can be the advantages that we could derive. Thank you, uh, Mr. Girish. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you everyone uh, who are on the panel uh, joining me today uh, to have this discussion. Uh, well, uh, talking of blockchain, I can only speak from the fact that uh, today I am uh, uh, already involved as a director of a company called Go Micro, which is an Australian company. And we have designed uh, what we call the, the blockchain uh, for food and uh, agriculture. Uh, as well as for the aquaculture industry. And uh, currently we are, uh, uh, we are working with a number of companies, including Bears and uh, Syngenta, along with some uh, uh, 
uh, aquaculture com uh, companies out of Australia as well as in India who are involved in the fishing and fisheries industries in uh, tracking and tracing live data, uh, which is what you described, uh, the, the first function of a blockchain, that it has to provide traceability of the product. And the biggest uh, problem of traceability of the product uh, is in the uh, agricultural and the aquacultural uh, industries, where uh, you need to understand where did the fish come from, where did the meat come from, what was the time that uh, the fish was caught. So to give you an example of an actual uh, design of the blockchain that we have carried out in the fishing industry, and this is for a large fishing industry, uh, fishing company in the, in the Australian uh, uh, continent. Uh, what we do is uh, we have equipped uh, uh, the, the carrier boxes or the cooler boxes in which the fish is uh, uh, caught uh, and kept after it is caught from the waters. At, at the time of loading the fish into these uh, cooler boxes, which then goes into the deep freeze within the, the trawler's hold, uh, we have fitted uh, what we call uh, um, uh, 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 what we call uh, uh, I'm just getting the word for it. Uh, uh, the right word for it would be <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a module that tracks uh, the exact location, uh, the latitude and the longitude of the trawler. Uh, so it has got the the GPS coordinates with it. Uh, it can uh, catch the temperature uh, at which uh, the, the sea water was there. Uh, it also uh, looks at uh, the, the data of the, of, the, of the fish. So, you know, live images of the fish as it is put into that carton are, are captured. And that uh, carton is then put into the hole. So as soon as it goes into the hole, um, the temperature is also then tracked at the same time. That starts the journey of the fish as it moves from the trawler, when it comes to the docks, when it goes into a deep freezer or a, or a uh, what you call a cold storage, and then from a cold storage through the supply chain as it reaches till the point of retail. The entire chain is captured on these data loggers and the data logger, which is we are using, uh, has both the GPS uh, coordinates as well as all the data that is required, which is then linked to the transaction. So. If the trawler is selling the fish to the wholesaler who is, who is now taking it and then keeping it into his cold storage, that data logger is also capturing the physical as well as the information transaction. Uh, so the live images, uh, the temperatures, the coordinates, as well as uh, the transactional details as to what time uh, the transaction took place at what uh, uh, quantity and what price did the transaction take place. This is then linked to the next chain and the next chain and the next chain. So at the time, if a, if a retail customer walks into Woolworths in, in Australia and wants to understand uh, how fresh is the fish, because the, the fishmonger is telling them that this is the freshest fish, uh, if they scan the QR code there, they can get only the data about uh, the, the time the fish was caught, how many, how many days it spent in which cold storage, and how fresh the catch was. Uh, so it only provides the data that is required, but the entire data of that blockchain is captured and is uh, available to all the partners uh, within the blockchain. This has been developed by the, by, by the Australian company, as I explained, uh, Go Micro. They use a very high quality microscopic lens that fits into any uh, mobile phone uh, and, and captures live images. Uh, so it captures, uh, if you want to capture uh, the quality of the tuna, uh, you can open the gill and you can take the image. It captures the redness. It can tell whether the tuna is contaminated, how fresh it is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's got the live images of every single product. That's the practical use that we do in, uh, in uh, capturing the blockchain data. And this is a live example. In India, we are working with bears and with bears, we are looking at the grains that come in the food supply chain. So we uh, work with the the Food Corporation of India, bears who are working with the farmers and, the, and, and we are capturing not only the information of the, of the rice or the wheat that is produced, but we are also capturing the size of the grain. And so we can compare the size of the grain and that the comparison is available through that uh, blockchain to all the partners. And at, at the time of transactions, 
there is no uh, negotiation because the size of the image is uh, correlated to the price and, and the quality. And not only that, now we have added another complexity to the blockchain that at the time of uh, uh, harvesting, we also capture the quality of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, farmland and the soil, and we also embed that into the blockchain so that if there are any pesticides, if there are any insects, those are also uh, you know recorded into the world. So that's that's the 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 beauty of it. It is making uh, the transaction very easy, very transparent, very trustworthy, and. Uh, I think uh, the, the benefits that we see for this Australian company today, uh, the savings are about 15 to 20% in the entire transaction cost. And that's a huge amount of savings. So uh, that's, that's I, I just wanted to share this story with you. Yes, very interesting. Yes, um, at least we have seen a, a few instances where blockchains have been used in this country. And uh, it's also heartening to see that, yes, India is also coming on to the you know, blockchain bandwagon. And we have... Uh, uh, solution providers like Truffle here who uh, are uh, in, at the forefront of evangelization for blo blockchain. Truffle, if I could bring you in at this point in time and uh, uh, if I were to ask you to evangelize for blockchain, I think that would be the first starting point for uh, the others also. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Girish. Uh, so I think uh, Harry said the context uh, by telling you a story of how they have used blockchain, right? Um, I think let me kind of say it in two ways. Uh, you asked about what is the value proposition, right? What we are seeing is that anywhere between top two, two to 5% of the top line, right? Harry was mentioning 15 to 20% of operations efficiency. I'm quoting a slightly different statistic, which is at the top line relevant. So two to 5% of your top line is the benefit that you can aim with with a blockchain-based platform. Now, where does that come from? Right? Um, I, I'll talk more about it uh, when uh, in the next few minutes, but broadly, I would leave you with three ways of thinking about where, so if you're a $100 million revenue company, we're talking about two to 5 million um, adding to bottom line, right? So that's, that's where it comes from. Where does it come from? See, if you think about how companies have been operating, companies have, mostly been looking at digitizing their operations within the four walls of the boundary that they run in. Right? Where this benefit is coming from is saying, okay, can we have a platform, a digital platform, which connects us and our suppliers or distributors upstream or downstream, the financiers, the logistics providers on a shared platform? And what does that shared visibility of operations enable? Right? Harry gave the example of traceability, right? Uh, which is why would traceability be important? Remember, consumers are getting more and more demanding. The regulations are getting more and more demanding. Uh, expect environmental, social, and governance, what we call ESG compliance, to be, get stricter as we move forward in a world which is trying to fight climate change, right? Uh, transparency and traceability is important for those reasons to satisfy the customers. That is one big theme. The second big theme is, I think, traditionally, the boundary between operation, supply chain operations and supply chain finance, there has been a glass wall between them, right? Operations runs independently, finance runs independently, right? Trying to get them together to work on a shared platform is the second value proposition. And the third, of course, as I mentioned, is uh, breaking down the silos between companies which are trying to operate together. Now, let me make it concrete for you, right? One approach of doing this is each company trying to build this solution on its own. And for certain sizes of that company, that makes sense because they are so big that doing it in-house makes sense. We have, as a product technology product company, we are taking a slightly different route. What we are saying is, think about how you use WhatsApp groups today. Right? If 10 people have to coordinate, let's say, organizing an event, right? we quickly form a WhatsApp group together and then coordinate what we need to do to achieve the objective that is in us. Now realize that this is not possible to do today between companies. There is no platform where one company can quote unquote create a group between its suppliers, its banks, its logistics partners, whoever they want. Right? And then they want to coordinate transactions. 
So our the way we are approaching it is here is a solution that you can start using. Come to the platform, create a group between you and your suppliers. If you want to bring in banks, you bring in banks for supply chain financing or bill discounting. If you want to bring in your logistics operator, bring in your logistics operator. So whoever you want to add to the group, you add to the group. Note that I have not used the word blockchain till now. The word blockchain is hidden two or three layers deep. Every time you create a group on our platform, we underneath the hood are using blockchain technology. And I think that is one of the key things because we need to be able to talk in terms of business impact and readiness to use. Blockchain is just an enabling technology. The idea of creating a group between companies where multiple parties can transact with each other with shared visibility of things like tracking where my inventory is, where my payment is, where is the, is there a shortfall in the uh, inventory that is sitting? Maybe something happened here where I need to update the order because there has been a disruption. One, because of COVID, for example, we have seen this so many times. One supplier is not able to deliver. How do I coordinate with him to change his order and reduce the quantity or change the time at which he, has, he or she has to deliver something and place an order on somebody else? These transactions continue to rely on emails, PDF, paper documents, and that is where the savings are coming from. If you are able to create a shared platform for coordination between multiple companies, what we call B2B groups on our platform markets, and that's what we are fundamentally enabling. And once you get into this thought process that I don't need to digitize just my operations within my four walls, but I need to work together with my partners. And I use the word partners liberally to include suppliers, contract manufacturers, financiers, logistics partners, distributors, retailers, you decide who your key priorities are. But we offer a platform for you to create that digital platform where you can work together. And as I said, just focus on the business impact. Technology, leave it to us. You focus on the business impact. The number that should be in your mind is 2 to 5% of your top line. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. That was very interesting. In fact, now we have two perspectives, one from a top line perspective and the other from the operational efficiency perspective. And also, it uh, you have brought about a very interesting um, and, and very crucial aspect of it that uh, as a supply chain professional, don't worry on technology. Leave it to um, the, the experts to decide what is the right technology for you and to tailor the technology for you. Uh, at this point in time, probably I would like to bring in uh, Meherer. Sir, if we could, uh, you know, uh, Praful talked about uh, uh, you know, how as a supply chain professional, uh, they need to look at the business side of aspects of it by leaving technology to the technologies because rightly said, blockchain is not something that you and I can uh, so easily master at this point in time. Uh, and uh, for us, blockchain is one more element in the technology spectrum which is available. So if I were to come back to you and say, if you were to look at blockchains as a, as a user of technology, uh, what would be your concerns and what would be your priority areas and how do you prioritize them? So Girish, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, I think uh, it was well covered by the earlier speakers. I would like to answer you in two contexts. One being a technology guy, I would like to cover the technology piece. Yes. So having said that, uh, one of the important parts is to understand what is blockchain technology. So when we talk about blockchain technology, it's a database that stores encrypted blocks of data that chain them together for a logical single source of truth for the data. When you're talking about trusted network, that is the one important tick in your piece. Digital assets are distributed instead of copied and transferred and created emulated records of an asset. So that is another part. The asset is decentralized, allow, allowing full real-time access and transparency to the public. The fourth part is that transparent ledgers of changes have the integrity of the documents, which creates the trust in the assets. And the last part is that blockchain inherits security measures and plug public ledgers in prime technologies. So when I talk about these, these five, six pillars of technology, this can be developed on platforms which can be in numerous ways 
a technology partner or a service provider can provide this technology when i talk about that so this is the technology piece when i come back to a use case when you talk about transparency you're talking about resiliency and especially on the trusted supply chain where does the supply chain pro uh, you know uh, a person like me working on a uh, a logistic and a supply chain for my customers how does it fit in so basically it talks about where i can implement it so solutions today we are talking about vaccination which is very one of the critical areas which blockchain can be used you're talking about uh, documents workflow i'm critically mentioning the workflow and i do not want workflow to be compared to blockchain i do not want that to be really coming down because there are a lot of service provider which gives you a workflow solution and not a blockchain solution so and that that's why i'm saying and then a food uh, and a, and a, and a, uh, a mechanism where we, we can use a lot of these activities in a retail environment which is going to be an express line uh, management software that can be used and especially in our sea freight part the container logistics is going to be one of the very big building forces which can be identified so i feel a supply chain area is very very important so i come back to uh, the the logistics and supply chain when i talk about a use case for me it is the ecosystem which is going to run the blockchain and that's very very important so when i talk about implementation as grand and as huge which can be implemented for a freight forwarder for example and then i take this technology to my customer and say that i am going to operate on a blockchain technology it's not an a singular activity right it's a consortium yes. of customs banks indian overseas everybody on one platform that could be looking at so obviously there could be a lot of areas like i've been working with trade lanes and msc and a lot of other service providers which have solutions on it but is it complete is it ready to offer all the solutions so i am very much gungo about blockchain coming in uh, and it can be a realistic scenario and it could be the future technology and a business case which can be deriving various benefits so i will answer more questions of you to just make some use cases which are going to be really important to you girish over to you thank you thank you mehra yes uh, yes we need to understand what the benefits of the technology are and yes Uh, we also need to understand that unlike other pieces of technology uh, security and transparency are inbuilt into the platform into the underlying technology therefore uh, they are given as a part of the technology i think i think this is also giving me an opportunity to uh, bring in yepe into the uh, discussion uh, yepe is from mersk and uh, he heads the trade line uh, initiative uh, yepe if i could uh, uh, invite you for your comments and mehrer also did mentioned that one of the larger challenges that they have is in the containerization and understanding uh, trash track and tra you know trace of track and trace of container movements so if you could uh, uh, come in with your initial comments please yeah uh, thank you krish uh, and we are doing a big initiative together with ibm in mersk the trade lens initiative and it's quite an ambition ambitious initiative because we are not trying to build a mers solution here what we are actually trying to build is an industry solution so our thought was if we don't try to disrupt ourselves then we will be disrupted by others so we might as well look at the industry that definitely need to be disrupted so what when we look at this like there's so many entities involved in a shipment maybe 30 different entities involved in the ship and they need to share events like information so they have this one to one connection which is with each other and they also need to share some documents which are being sh uh, shipped by airplanes from one part of the world to another so you actually ship paper from one place to another in order to actually release the goods and sometimes we also need to realize that when containers are delayed it's not only due to the container not being there sometimes the container arrived and then we actually missing the documents for the goods to be declared or for the cargo to be released so we are very dependent on all these parties being able to share with each other uh, the events what are we looking at and also the documents sometimes i lose use the analogy of a running relay where what we see in the industry is kind of like if you have a 400 meter running relay where people sit with 
earphones on and blindfolded. So I start to run, but the next person I need to hand over to, they just sit on a chair and are not ready to receive the information or receive the documents that I'm giving to them. If we look at the Olympics, you see that the second runner gets up and get up to speed to actually for the first runner to hand over the baton. And this is where we need to get at, at saying we can optimize individually. We need to work together as all the logistics service provider to provide our data, to provide tr transparency on the events where the containers, it's been gated out, it's been gated in full. This is what is happening. And also to share the documents because with the documents being shared, there's multiple, multiple parties that need to access some of these documents. And of course, here we are dependent on of a technology that allows us to share information to the right parties. And also when we share documents to know, okay, is this the latest version of the document? What has been happening to this? Is there a new version? So this audit trail on the documents are very important. And this transparency on the events and the transparency of the documents become interesting for all the different stakeholders that are involved, whether that is like us as an ocean carrier, as a terminal, as a trucking company, or as a custom authority, because I can see where the goods been coming from, where has they been transshipped? I can see the documents up front. So what we're also experiencing when we're engaging with custom authorities is that they say, okay, we can actually put you into a fast track if you utilize the TradeLens platform, because we will be able to easier assess which containers to inspect and also easier to do pre-clearance because we have all the information ready before it actually arrives. And I think this is the important part that we can limit the enormous amount of time being spent on trying to get access to data, the enormous time being spent calling, emailing, uh, even telex still, like documents, stuff like that, sending documents purchased by, by couriers from one end of the world to another end of the world, all these things we can remove. So what will happen is some of the cost will disappear and also the timing, hopefully, the journey of the container will come also be, be, be shorter. So we can actually take a few days off the journey, and that would mean a lot for some exporters to say, okay, that actually allows me to export more of these per perishable goods or other things that it's very important for us that it, it goes faster, like the full journey here. But we will also, and as we are seeing now, we are... Uh, releasing our second part of the initiative that is the e-bill of lading uh, on the TradeLens platform, where we as MERS can channel say, okay, we actually need, need to reduce the cost of actually global trade. And this is where we've been able to remove some of the surcharges on MERS side, because right now we are digitalizing this. So instead of having manual processes, we have been removing some of the, the cost to serve. And thereby I've been convincing that MERS the organizations say, okay, with e-bill of lading, we will not have any surcharges. Of course, there's a cost of buying the e-bill of lading solution as such, but the surcharges are immersed because everything is digitalized. Then we can actually remove this cost and maybe $65 like in many parts of the world, right? So yes. by removing some of the cost and by making it easier for the parties to actually share information and the power of transparency is really, really important here, both when it comes to container events in this case, or when it comes to documents that I want to share in a, a machine readable way. In this case, it's a JSON format. So it's actually a structured format that you can share so that other parties can read the information in the document instead of having a PDF where I need to sit and type in the information into my TMS system or whatever. So that are some of the aspects that we are seeing. But of course, we also need to realize that with complex innovation, it's never one giant leap. It's always small steps that brings us there. So I think this important part is also that all of us need to chip in and we need to lean in and say, okay, how do we start this? Because not everything will be solved right away. So we will need to start small and then let it grow and let it expand. And I think that's a very important aspect that all stakeholders need to lean in and take their part of actually doing this transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, indeed. Uh, we need to start and we need to build confidence as we go in, not only in ourselves, but also in the ecosystem players. Uh, in fact, if I could now bring in um, Sachin, uh, 
uh, Sachin also has got a uh, collaboration with you, uh, with Trade Lens and uh, uh, Gateway Rail Freight, and uh, has also a collaboration. Sachin, if you were to take this uh, uh, to the next level, uh, what are the advantages you are seeing? What are the uh, challenges you are seeing? And more importantly, uh, what are the nature of services that you are now planning to have? Uh, would you see, for example, somewhere uh, uh, even payments being processed through a blockchain application that we are having? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Singh, Girish, and the entire Institute of Supply Chain Management team. Uh, instead of taking it to the next level, I will actually bring it to a little lower level to start with. Uh, I will try to be a little elementary as well as a little more generic uh, from the uh, audience point of view. Sachin, Sachin, we can do without a PPT because we are having okay. a discussion. We can, we can do away. With, we we can do away without the. Yeah, we, yeah, because yeah. nobody has so, used it. Yeah, so so I will try to be a little more generic as well as a little more uh, elementary in terms yes. of uh, 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 assessing the uh, potential that uh, the, the uh, uh, blockchain technology can unleash for the supply chain event. So classically, if you look at it, inventory management was a standalone event. And uh, there used to be a, a, a purchase department in an organization. The business as usual involved a purchase department, a logistics department supporting the purchase department. And there used to be a lot of imperfections in terms of information being shared between the two of them. This is within an organization. Now, when you step outside the organization, uh, then there were, there were imperfections of physical movement of goods as well as physical movement of documents. In fact, there used to be a parallel logistics system of documentation alongside the logistics of the physical goods, initially by way of bulk and break bulk and now by way of containerized transportation. So when we participated in the trade, trade lens initiative of jointly being promoted by uh, uh, Musk and uh, IBM and being participated by some other shipping lines as well, uh, we looked not only at our processes, but we looked at others and tried to kind of philosophize to some extent. So what is business as usual? Business as usual is that all the participants maintain their own databases. They uh, keep their independent transaction documents from their point of view. They also have standard formats, which are standardized only for themselves, non-standardized for the entire industry as such. And then we try to exchange information by exchanging standard non-standard document and then there is a way of mining information data from these documents and transferring it by way of another imperfect solution by way of excel sheets by way of uh, 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 csv formats etc from one system to the other system taken to the next level maybe by getting a middleware between two systems which tries to talks and does some amount of uh, uh, electronic uh, interchange of information. So while some information was exchanged electronically, a large part of information was actually being exchanged by way of physical document and that physical document was being physically carried. On top of that, in an Indian context, I would say, uh, the regulatory authorities would not only want that document to be seen, but to be authenticated by way of a signature and a stamp put by uh, a, a participant in the, uh, an actor in the uh, scheme of things. Yes. Now, this is what results into uh, not only delays, which were mentioned by Epe in his uh, uh, very crisp, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, monologue about uh, how the uh, uh, blockchain technology can help, but it also results into the blindfolded part of which he mentioned is that all the actors actually cannot see what is happening on ocean, on land, uh, at the warehouses, on the truck, on the trains, on the uh, uh, ocean going vessels. So there is a tendency of building a elbow room or let's say a spare capacity, a redundancy at all stages resulting into buildup of inventory at all locations. And in reality, though the entire, let's say, supply chain, both in terms of unbound uh, supply chain of intermediates and raw material, as well as outbound supply chain of finished products from the point of view of uh, uh, transportation, uh, storage, and distribution, there is an additional inventory which is carried by everyone. And that is where the uh, uh, increase in cost of logistics actually sets in. 
so i'm not only carrying more inventory but i'm also spending more um, more money on storing and handling it and if everything is going to flow through a, 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 a let's say a a, a a a redundant stock of inventory being uh, maintained then i'm also handling everything twice so all this put together not only brings in efficient inefficiencies by way of delays as well as increased cost but also results into additional inventory being carried now in order to deal with this there is a need to bring in a transparent but at the same time adequately protected from the rest of the world because there will be a commercial importance of keeping this information secret within the actors a, a mechanism by which information can be shared but at the same time kept uh, 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 confidential in order to ensure that all these transactions as well as information related to the transactions can flow through easily that's where the blockchain philosophy comes in i would look at blockchain more from a philosophy point of view rather than from a because as a profil very uh, 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 crisply mentioned about how the technology is going to take care of the technology part of it and the concentration of the actors in the business will have to be on harnessing maximum benefit out of it in terms of increasing efficiencies reducing cost as well as reducing the build up of inventory at multiple locations so that's the first perspective part of it now second perspective is that one should not consider this is that this is going to be a panacea this is going to solve all our problems because before that and that's why i said that i need to bring it down to a little lower level all the imperfections in the hard infrastructure which is involved in transfer of raw material intermediate goods and finished products from point of mining or let's say uh, uh, farms or let's say marine farms into the hands of the processing units manufacturing units into the transportation uh, network ably supported by the banking and the insurance agencies as well as the regulators like customs for the purpose of tr uh, cross border uh, uh, trade etc but it will also have to be kind of enabled in such a way that the quality of information is not only reliable but is also smooth that's number one part of it and the second part of it is that the the chain then becomes more like a a, a smooth conduit rather than uh, what uh, dr singh called as uh, the uh, uh, bull whip effect wherein 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 there there are there are a lot of variations which take place as far as all the activities are concerned so indian context to put it in indian context the hard infrastructure that we talk about it is going to be of great importance so we have congestion at the port because the ports are not perfect in terms of the infrastructure which is available there evacuation from the port the port may be a great asset to have but the entry and exit at the gate of the port is going to be congested so that will result into imperfections simultaneously information as well as the statistical reports ably assisted by data analytics as well as artificial intelligence and machine learning will result into everyone everyone turning out to be more uh, intelligent at the end of it resulting into identifying uh, imperfections in the hard infrastructure and once you take care of the hard infrastructure the maximum benefit which can be derived out of blockchain technology or blockchain philosophy in terms of smoothening out the rough edges as far as the the supply chain is concerned can be brought in so indian context we will have to keep our eyes on the hard infrastructure alongside blockchain assistance the technology assistance i would rather call it in terms of bringing down imperfections in the supply chain process thank you praful it was indeed fantastic that was one of the biggest concerns that uh, you know when we were speaking to a lot of people uh infrastructure was pointed out and and specifically in india infrastructure was pointed out as uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have to overcome as a nation uh, in when we have to uh, adopt a technology like uh, blockchain uh that i think brings us to the close of the first set of panel first panel in our um, uh, discussion and i thank all my speakers uh, harry epe mehre praful and uh, sachin each of you have brought out one aspect of this technology which can be used and also you did touch on something which is very relevant at each level and especially i like what sachin specifically mentioned at the last point which is that it is not just that every if that technology is not the only thing that you need to also be conscious about you need to be conscious about the infrastructure and all the other players in the ecosystem to be on the same page with you if you need to uh, introduce a foundational technology like this and that yes this is a foundational technology this is going to be at a level which is below your business 
uh, aspect. It is not going to be visible as you would probably have an ERP system or a business analytics solution. It is the foundation on which you're going to build your systems and therefore it is going to be one level abstracted from most users and which is going to give you the benefit of looking at it in uh, sharing information, ensuring security and create uh, a better as better uh, supply chain going forward. In fact, uh, uh, starting with a 10, 10 to 15% operational efficiency gains to uh, 2 to 5% of um, you know, uh, top line gains. We have seen potential in what the blockchains can offer. I thank you all for uh, your valuable insights. Uh, I would now like to invite Praful to uh, uh, speak about two or three issues that we would like him to also touch when he, and this has also come up from the uh, uh, audience. A couple of people within the audience have also asked, uh, uh, one is that uh, how do we build an ecosystem and partnership uh, to create this as a service? How do we use this as a service? And also, uh, can this technology minimize loss? Uh, one of the uh, questions that we did have was that can this technology also help us in minimizing uh, transit loss? So, and the third question was that how do we bring all of them together and uh, do you see at some point in time, uh, Indians also would be able to use a blockchain for payment? Uh, I don't talk the cryptocurrency, but probably the normal payment in a, you know instructions being initiated through a blockchain. Over to you, Raful. You're on mute, sir. All right. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, so what I would do is I would take you through a short presentation uh, where I would kind of address all the questions that have come up, right? Um, and let me start by taking the bull by the horns, right? Questions about ROI, business impact. Uh, how do we build a use case for adoption in the industry? Let's jump right into it. And uh, as I have been saying, forget the technology, we can provide the technology, right? What is the ROI? And I mentioned two to 5% of top line impact. Where does it come from? In our view, it comes from two ways, two themes inside your supply chain. One, it comes from your operations. And second, it comes from supply chain finance. So either you can look at supply chain operations or you can look at supply chain finance, right? Now, first let's look at your upstream supply chain, which is your procure to pay side. Now, what are the typical challenges that supply chain professionals face today uh, is for example, inbound inventory management, right? Uh, I order, you ordered something, you received something else, right? There's a supplier who's sitting on more inventory than he should be. Uh, there is a pricing error, right? You negotiated a contract or an order at a certain level and the price that was put in the invoice was a different invoice, different value. There was service level agreement that you negotiated very hard, but nobody is really taking care of enforcing these LS, SLAs by making sure that the penalties are imposed when they should be to ensure that the on-time on -time info increases or bonuses are given. There are shipping vendor errors. We have seen instances where the material has arrived, but there is no place in the warehouse. So the truck is standing outside. Uh, we have seen issues where uh, something is sent very late, which is a very common problem and that is blocking the whole supply chain. Right? Uh, the wrong shipping carrier was used because of which the cost went up. These are all examples. Take a moment to kind of think about what's going on. Fundamentally, what's going on is your, the way you are running your system is not in sync with how your partners are running the system and these systems are not talking to each other, not allowing you to coordinate. Now you flip it around and say, this was my upstream. The same thing can also happen on the downstream where you are the supplier and you are coordinating with your distributor retail channels. And the same thing starts to show up there. That's the mirror image. Right? So I'm not going to that, but you can imagine the very same things being applied there. When it comes to finance, what are the problems? Late payment penalties, right? Somebody is now sending you an invoice and saying there's a payment penalty, right? Uh, there is a lack of coordination between the finance department and the operations uh, resulting in late payment penalties being imposed. Reconciliation errors, right? Uh, the Your supplier believes you owe him X, you believe you owe him Y, and the finance departments and accounting departments are trying to reconcile the payables and receivables. Uh, sometimes this gets very ugly and it can go to disputed invoices. And hours, hundreds of hours spent 
in reconciling this, right? Uh, you may have negotiated an early payment discount, right? But you're not availing of it because nobody's tracking it. These are all issues of parties not being able to either silos between you and your supplier or silos between your finance department and operations. And again, you can flip it around and the same thing also repeats on the downstream. These are the places where value is hidden. These are the places where shared digital ecosystems provide value, right? The way you need to think about it, if I may give you a framework that traditionally we have thought about digitization within an enterprise and you have used tools like ERPs and accounting systems. But each one of these organizations today and you, what I'm showing on the horizontal, there will be a manufacturer, supplier, logistics provider, bank, each one of them has their own IT systems. And when it comes to coordinating between them, in the orange, we are showing logistics. In, in the golden yellow thing, we are showing the movement of money. And then we are showing the movement of information. This is something that Sachin talked about, right? Something that Harry talked about, something that Yepe talked about. That information today moves either in emails or in literal physical documents. This is creating the problem. The problem today in supply chains is that information transfer is slowest right? Money transfer is of course instantaneous. Goods transfer takes time. Believe it or not, information transfer today takes more time than, um, than uh, goods transfer. And that's the problem that we are trying to solve. If you want to think about this, the best way to think about what blockchain can build is what we call a cross enterprise digital ecosystem, where the digital ecosystem is built and shared by multiple parties. Value, as I showed you, comes from improved coordination, reducing cost of operations, and I'll give you examples of creating new revenue models. And this theme exists no matter which sector of your, your supply chain is in, whether it's industrial product, whether it's automotive, whether it's trade finance, whether it's energy. This is a theme that we see again and again and again. And studies, this is a study that came out less than three, three months ago between McKinsey and Deloitte, talking about the opportunity in the automotive ecosystem. But these things are now beginning to emerge. The cross enterprise digital ecosystems are beginning to emerge, which will impact top line as well as EBIT, right? So what we have been working on for the past two and a half years is what we, is the solution we call Market Send. This was what I was talking about. Market Send as a platform that we offer allows you to create business groups on demand. And what I'm showing on the right picture is that there are different companies shown in white so sitting around the boundary or the circumference and the orange ring in the middle is what we say is a business group connecting these parties. Underneath the hood, this business group is actually a private blockchain, but that is not relevant as far as the supply chain talk is concerned. Yes, there is a blockchain, uh, but think about it in terms of business groups. And these business groups are digital ecosystems for cross enterprise collaboration, right? So what is market send the solution? It's an ERP compatible, cloud hosted solution for enterprises. What is the value proposition? Three value propositions. One, the ability to create digital ecosystems for B2B coordination. Two, including your banks and financiers in the ecosystem so that you can enable digital finance, treat them as part of your supply chain. Don't think of them as separate from your supply chain, right? This is where they are able to, uh, why should you think of them in terms of your supply chain? Because once you are able to share the transaction history that are going in in your supply chain, they can, without requiring you to send to them quote unquote documents, they can have visibility into the audit trail of your transactions and they can enable things like anytime financing. They can enable things like deep tier financing for your suppliers of suppliers. This is where the finance and somebody asked this question, how will finance integrate with uh, operations, this is how finance integrates with operation. When you start to share digitally signed auditable records with your banks or financier, they are able to offer you finance when you need, where you need, right? New revenue models come from what we call digital assets. And I'll give you an example of this also, how you can monetize the data. This is not possible for every industry, but I'll give you a couple of examples of how data monetization is becoming a trend in certain industries. Uh, you can look at Traceability, why, why is traceability uses? I'll give you an example. The cost of recycled plastic now is higher than the cost of virgin plastic in Europe. But how do you prove to your customers that this is in fact recycled plastic or this, or how the product that you are actually selling is 
sustainable? How do you prove to them? And that is where digital assets come into picture. The ability to track physical products as they move across the supply chain is the value proposition. Going back to digital ecosystem, more traditional use cases, the ability to track orders, shipments, payments, but let me emphasize, not just for you, but for your supply chain partners as well. Remember, this is a shared ecosystem between multiple enterprises. The ability to adapt to disruptions, right? To, to be able to say, uh, I want to up change an order, right? You, you issued a purchase order. Now you want to change the quantity. Maybe you want to change the delivery date. Maybe you want to change the price because you have negotiated the price and the commodity prices have changed. Huge nightmare today because systems don't talk to each other. And all of this happens over emails, PDFs, Excel sheets, right? And the ability to automate reconciliation with smart contracts to reduce disputes. Uh, I will talk, give you an example of each one of these use cases. For example, digital ecosystem, digital assets, and digital finance. Uh, these are the use cases that we talked about. Where are they being used in the real world? Here's an example. Uh, Hindalco is one of our customers who are using this for real-time coordination and tracking of shipments, orders, and invoices, uh, both in logistics uh, to automate the logistics contracts, but also to track the visibility of inventory across multiple locations, just to get visibility of where my inventory is in the supply chain, right? By bringing together, by bringing together themselves, logistic providers and suppliers on a shared digital ecosystem. Uh, what is the ROI impact here? Improvement in SLA enforcement, which not only reduces your outflow in cash, but also improves the performance of the supply chain because once SLA enforcement gets strict and automated, then performance automatically improves. One click access to capital, I'll cite the example of one of our other customers here. This is an NBFC based out of Chennai, which is bringing together uh, FPOs, farmer producer organizations with corporate buyers of agricultural products and they themselves, enabling supply chain financing and or bill discounting or invoice financing, improving the cash flow of their FPOs. Uh, data monetization is something that MG Motors we are working with, where we are creating a digital product passport, where the end user, the vehicle owner, controls who can see the data about its vehicle, right? And they can share it with the insurance company to get a lower premium. They can share it with a used car buyer to improve the residual value or the resale value of the car, right? So this is where the different kinds of solutions get enabled. I emphasize again, blockchain is the enabling technology. These are all benefits of what happens when multiple companies in a supply chain work together in a coordinated fashion on a digital platform. Everything that you see on the screen right now is an example of this, whether it's supply chain operations, reducing the op getting operations efficiencies, whether it's supply chain finance, whether it's about creating new revenue models, right? Um, how it works, I'll give you some snapshots. I gave you an example of WhatsApp. That's how the platform works. We allow the creation of these groups. One group can have multiple companies. You can create secure private B2B groups on demand. Groups can consist of your suppliers, can banks, NBFCs, whoever you want. You can create multiple groups, right? Data is not shared across groups. And that is how we honor data privacy. Inside the group, remember, this is not a chatting product. This is not for communication. It is meant for transactions. So within the group, companies can transact with each other. Why do we use blockchains to create these groups? Because we create an audit trail. What is an audit trail? An audit trail is a digitally signed, time-stamped, non-modifiable record of what is happening in the group. So in this case, you are seeing the audit trail of a purchase order. You see at this time, this order was created. At this time, a shipment was dispatched. At this time, a shipment was received. At that time, an invoice was created. Now, you would have seen this in your ERP, but this is not your ERP. Note at the top right that this audit trail is available and viewable by multiple entities inside the group. These are the four companies which are participating in this purchase order, and all four of them have visibility into this. Now, why is this beneficial? Imagine a bank having visibility into this who may decide to offer you finance at after the invoice stage, or maybe after the shipment stage, or maybe even after the purchase order stage. How do you do that? Simply use the share button and extend the visibility to the right partner who needs visibility into this. So what we are doing is we are moving, and a couple of speakers talked about this. We are moving from a world where documents were primarily used for verification of transactions and coordination to real-time visibility of audit trail of transactions becoming the way we coordinate with each other. This also helps with process enforcement and compliance. 
right? This is what our platform looks like. Um, I am running out of time, so I won't have time to talk about this, but I will point out the shared visibility of a digital asset like invoice between multiple parties, the ability that multiple parties act on the same asset to change its states as parties act on it, audit trails, smart contract based SLA compliance, the ability to go back from an invoice to an order to a shipment, and if you have IoT data, the ability to integrate that data also as part of the audit trail. Shared visibility of objects, business objects, and business operations is fundamentally what we enable, right? So as you will see, what is happening here is we are enabling the creation of groups which are underneath the hood blockchain networks. We also have a bridge where we connect to public blockchains. This is useful in some scenarios where you want to prove the traceability of your products to somebody who's not necessarily part of your groups, maybe a customer of your customer. Then that is the part where the public blockchain comes in, where digital certificates can be issued and anybody in the world can verify the traceability. Right? We are hosted on the cloud, we are ready to use SaaS. And of course, we have API integrations with your ERPs, uh, tally, accounting systems, uh, GSTN networks, and so on and so forth. Right. I will stop here and perhaps hand it over Girish back to you uh, to kind of pick up and happy to answer any questions that people might have. Thanks, Profil. That's indeed. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, sharing the insights onto your uh, plat into the platform that you offer and also the uh, underlying how, how the ease of use of such a platform uh, where we can focus on the business aspect of it <clears throat> without worrying too much about the technology aspect of it. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Sure. And, and thank you for being a partner to uh, ISCM forums. Uh, with this, we move on to our next uh, part of the uh, agenda, which is essentially trying to uh, discussing about how do we prepare uh, our companies for adopting blockchains? What are the key risks and challenges that we have? Uh, I have a very uh, eclectic panel here. Uh, I have Divakar Muthu, who is uh, the CSPO from Ford Automobiles, Rajesh Rao, Head AI and Innovation of Rolls-Royce, Tanmay Banerjee, Blockchain Architect at Boeing, Rohit Pajni, Head Business and Supply Chain, ITC Limited, and Amey Rajput from Tech Mahindra. Uh, thank you very much uh, for taking your time off and uh, coming for this edition of the first uh, supply chain technology blockchain. Uh, in the previous session, we discussed about how the, fund the foundational aspects of, the, of blockchain and how uh, this foundational aspect uh, can create opportunities for us, both in terms of um, top line, bottom line, and efficiency gains. Uh, I think this is now time for us to move in a little bit more narrower and get into actual uh, experiences and how we can ensure that uh, our enterprises are not only ready for blockchain, but also what are the uh, risks and challenges that we will face when we get on to uh, implementing blockchain as a solution or a solution based on a blockchain. I should not be using it the other way around. It's a solution which is based on blockchain rather than blockchain as a solution. I'm sorry for that. So if you were to use that, we would now like, well, like to take it into that realm. And then probably I would first want to uh, invite Rajeshri to uh, uh, take us through her experience of looking at uh, blockchain-based solutions and how uh, we can, as organizations, um, it, uh, how can we use a blockchain-based solution probably into a legacy system? What are the kind of um, challenges that we have when we prepare for adopting solutions based on blockchains? Um, hi, Girish, and uh, uh, very good evening to all the audience. And thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, it's a pleasure to be sharing um, the panel with all the distinguished speakers as well from the industry. With that, I'll quickly begin with uh, a case study, um, which is not uh, definitely my industry, but uh, which is something that I'm very passionate about and I've worked in automobile industry. So I'm going to present a case study on uh, BMW. So how they have implemented their blockchain and what are some of the things, how they have handled it. So in, in fact, um, automotive supply chains are highly complex ecosystems that actually involve numerous players at different delivery stages. 
all the you know the stop the stops in an automotive supply chain can also change rapidly um, you know according to the needs of various industrial parts or including the raw the availability of raw materials the supply of specific components from a particular factory and the demand for automobiles in different regions so there's a huge load of requirements and everything depends on you know the the time the environment the place there are a lot of factors that affect the supply chain itself and especially given the pandemic we have we have seen how much of disruption that has ha happened within the supply chain industry itself right uh, not just supply chain industry but the overall supply chain and the value chain as well so coming back so you know um, so therefore resulting in many you know partners in a supply chain manage their um, you know the data as well now this has definitely created a dark like a network in which it is very difficult to track a components origin or traceability or even rather i would say not traceability origin or visibility of the entire supply road now in 2000 sorry in 2020 bmw announced the launch of its blockchain powered supply chain management um, a solution called it's called part chain now according to bmw part chain was launched in conjunction with its um, you know 10 suppliers so first you have to bring together those like minded people because anything disruptive or any new techno emerging technology is always like you know you resist okay whether this is going to be successful whether we'll be able to apply or not but till you don't test it out and try you're never going to you know pro progress or you can never you know make something uh, use of the best of what is there with you so now this uh, 10 suppliers came together so you know bmw then what they did is they used the distributed ledger technology to provide the transparency and traceability of components and raw materials used in production of their automobiles. Now, in 2019, BMW conducted a successful pilot project for purchasing, uh, you know, the front lights. And BMW indicated that the part chain project to provide seamless, you know, traceability through the entire supply chain without the need for a separate manual tracking system by using just the blockchain technology to connect all the parts. Now, that is how they came up with this pilot project to see how it works. In fact, one of the earlier speakers was talking about, you know, you have to first go internal, then before you go external, you have to test it and try it out and see how it works. And for which you can definitely, you know, they have so many vendors, there are so many suppliers. Uh, definitely, you know, at least out of the 100, you have 10 coming forward and saying, no, we want to try it, we will do it, right? So that's how BMW started their journey on it. And this move, you know, was designed to the to take the digitalization of purchasing at the BM, you know, at the BMW group to the next level itself. And that was a literally like a transformation. Literally, they are going through the part of the digital journey, the digital transformation journey itself. So BMW's vision um, is, is to create an open platform which will allow you know, the data within the supply chains to be exchanged and shared safely and in an anonymized uh, across the industry. So that was a way how they even focused on the data privacy and security. And so what happens? So besides the blockchain technology has also proven extremely useful for the supply chain management and examples, if I may have to use some of the other uh, automobile uh, uh, you know, companies who have ventured into this is Ford Motor and IBM, you know, using the technology to track their cobalt for electric car, uh, electric car batteries and Volkswagen using the mine spider, uh, that's uh, the blockchain for similar, the raw material tracking. And in addition as well, other auto, uh, auto manufacturers like uh, have used the technology to track cars, um, such as, you know, Hyundai Motor Groups, um, you know, they had this partnership with Blockco Inc., uh, one of the companies, right, uh, to track uh, the used vehicles. Um, so everybody had a different use cases they were testing and trying out. And the Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative, it's a consortium which includes BMW, that is a field testing, um, a blockchain-based international vehicle identification system. So there were different initiatives. Everybody were, you know, testing out, and definitely BMW were way ahead and trying to see how they could break this, uh, you know, the the technology barrier and have the, you know, most important is visibility and 
um, you know, trace not the at least to know the origin, and that's what they were able to achieve. Now, besides that, one of the most important uh, questions which Girish was asking during this was, how does it work with the legacy system? So I always go back, uh, you know, to the drawing board, or even when I talk to people <coughs> in terms of the innovation, I call it as open innovation. When it's open innovation, you come with saying, okay, you know, you, you get your new technologies or, you know, uh, sort of uh, a way forward, something which is very futuristic. But at the same time, please remember, whatever the legacy system exists, it is not about it, it becomes useless or redundant. It is only you have to adapt. So I always keep uh, telling that te a technology has to become interoperable and it has to be scalable, which means I just don't have to, uh, you know, remove the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I don't have to remove my existing, uh, the, the legacy system. You will have to reconstruct, you have to retrofit it and you have to restructure. That is what is very critical. And for that interoperability of the technology plays a very, very important role. So that is how, um, you know, today the technology companies have changed their direction on how they want to go forward. I hope I have answered your question, Girish. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, yes, Rajesh, it was um, uh, quite interesting to hear that, yes, you uh, just because a new technology has arrived does not mean that the old doesn't, ceases to work. And as we understand blockchain, it's an enabling technology, therefore uh, we need to harness that capability. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, if I could take the same uh, point across to uh, um, Rohit. Rohit, uh, uh, you know, one of the aspects that we spoke about, uh, in the pre one of the previous panelists, Harry did mention is about uh, uh, how they are using blockchains in Australia for uh, the fishery industry, for example, that's one of the things he quoted. And also he talked about bringing similar situations, some similar solutions for the, for the agri industry in India. Uh, I believe that you are also, you are also uh, trying out some of these solutions at ITC in terms of agri and creating uh, blockchain based solutions for track and trace of agri commodities. Uh, what would you say are the major benefits of using such a uh, blockchain-based solution in the agri-commodity market? And also, uh, how does it improve the resilience of our supply chain? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, actually, before I start, so I would take a minute or two just to, uh, uh, to spend on uh, how agri-value chain works in India in a very minimalistic uh, fashion. I, I, I assume that everybody understands about the problems of Indian agriculture and it needs no further elaboration. So uh, uh, the upstream side of uh, agri value chain uh, faces issues like uh, yagging yield, uh, lagging mm -hmm. yields uh, in key crops as uh, far as, uh, 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 I mean, if we compare it with the global averages, then there are uh, lack of trust I am going to switch off uh, my video just for the enablement of uh, uh, the better bandwidth. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, uh, uh, so I was talking about lagging yields uh, from upstream side of the value chain. There is lack of uh, trusted source uh, for uh, farm inputs. Then uh, there is a very high uh, input costs. Uh, timely credit itself is a very big problem. Restricted market linkage is a challenge. Uh, last but not the least, uh, precision agriculture uh, methods also uh, remains a key challenge in uh, most of our uh, agricultural geographies. Now, downstream side of agri value chain, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, the consumer is evolving, uh, is placing inherent focus on food, safe, food safety, sustainability, and health. Uh, he, he wants trust and transparency as uh, an evidence and not merely a claim. Uh, and on the other hand, there is a there is a requirement of uh, supporting the ever growing population uh, without deteriorating environmental and natural resources. Now, the like the question you asked, what blockchain brings to the table? So, uh, I think a blockchain technology has the potential to simplify and uh, integrate uh, agricultural uh, supply chains uh, in terms because uh, agricultural uh, supply chains are uh, having uh, so much inefficiencies which impact all the actors in the chain. Now, uh, 
it is estimated that cost of operating a supply chain makes up to two thirds of the final cost of goods. Uh, six to seven percent of global value of trade in agri value goods is merely absorbed by the documents alone. Now, transactions in agri uh, supply chain are uh, in, uh, inherently risky and complex. Henceforth, you will always find uh, the role of intermediaries, uh, right, which are uh, just trying to simplify the case. Uh, while con uh, conscious consumer is asking for more transparency and how it is coming, uh, how food is getting produced. Uh, on um, uh, other hand, there is a lot of manual uh, labor, a lot of uh, paperwork, lack of interoperability uh, between uh, different stakeholders. Now, blockchain uh, can bring in complete transparency, reduce risk in trade, and trade finance, and henceforth promote inclusive trade. It can increase access to agricultural financial services, uh, generate smart uh, market information, and provide uh, uh, greater legal uh, certainty to land uh, tenure systems. Uh, some agricultural companies are also doing it. In fact, we also did a pilot. So, I mean, there are several use cases I can talk about. I, I will restrict myself to a couple of use cases. Now, say, uh, imagine you walk into a superstore and you pick up a packet of pasta or noodles or maybe some pre-mix. Uh, there is a QR code on back of it. You scan that QR code. An entire story of that product uh, appears, how it was made, uh, how it was delivered in that plant uh, uh, before it actually came and resided on that shelf. It will tell you uh, what kind of food safety measures that it was taken in that factory, who supplied raw material to that factory, which would be wheat flour in this case, who supplied that wheat or agri-produce as a raw material to wheat flour manufacturer. Uh, I mean, if that product is claimed as organic or maybe say a food safe, then what was uh, the soil health? What was the was there any presence of any residues? What, what were the climatic and nutritional uh, indicators uh, while that pro, uh, uh, that crop was still uh, being grown? So, in fact, uh, a lot many other things can be provided to the consumer who can actually see the entire story. Right now, imagine this pasta has to be exported now. Right now. All supply chain actors, all uh, export-oriented uh, 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 details can be onboarded onto this uh, blockchain uh, by making all these relevant uh, stakeholders as participants. So this digital continuum uh, will act like uh, plug and play. So, so this is uh, one side of traceability. Now, there is another side of traceability also. Now, imagine uh, there is an outbreak of any animal or plant disease, right? there is some contaminated agri food product which is caught somewhere now blockchain can actually enable very efficiently businesses and regulators uh, to trace and pinpoint uh, uh, contaminated or fraudulent products more quickly and less wastefully uh, 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 both food fraud and food bone diseases are extremely costly in economic terms and uh, environmentally in terms of wasted resources so blockchain can uh, come to the rescue now, uh, there are a lot of transformative actions which can happen in um, agri value chain. There, there, there could be a transformation in trade finance, how things work, uh, in payments, in risk management, in agri insurance. It, it is a big potential area. Then, uh, in fact, there are so many stakeholders. The real time settlement using smart contracts can also change the entire landscape, uh, how agri value chains uh, uh, work, on, uh, work in India. And uh, so I will, I will take a pause here, right? I mean, uh, there are so many things I can still talk about. Uh, I will just say two or three more uh, things that uh, while, when we did this pilot in uh, bringing all the relevant stakeholders to blockchain platform, uh, we also felt that there are numerous challenges, right? Uh, um, um, while one goes uh, for implementing thing. Uh, so uh, if, if I have some time, I can speak about it, or maybe you can come back to me. I mean, I will leave it to you. Yeah, yeah, we will we will circle back uh, yeah, as we yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rohit, for that uh, uh, insight into how agriculture can benefit from a blockchain-based solution. Uh, coming back to uh, the auto industry, if I could bring in Divakar again here. Uh, Divakar, one of the one of the uh, fundamental areas where blockchain promises a lot of uh, benefits uh, is in terms of um, you know improving the resilience of our supply chain and also uh, 
uh, our ability to manage disruptions. If I could ask you, along with it, if I could ask you also to probably spend some insights on uh, one of the questions which have been asked by uh, uh, audience. Uh, Shreya has asked a question that, uh, are business houses of India ready for the transformation business processes that blockchain is offering? Okay. Um, so can you hear me? I hope yeah, yes, yeah, you audible. can. All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think uh, I'll just answer Shreya's question first, right? Uh, the answer is yes. I think it's about how you design and then how you basically uh, visualize the solution. And obviously, uh, you know, blockchain, as many of my esteemed panel members would agree, uh, is not meant for uh, it's it's not a solution that's meant for all the problems that you're having today. We really need to really identify the problem where blockchain is absolutely required and then really think about how it can basically integrate with your overall digital strategy and as well as your overall, if you're in the supply chain or the manufacturing space, how does it fit with your uh, the industry 4.0 transformation or your you know, plant floor digital transformation or your supply chain transformation. Uh, it's, it's, it's about how you basically visualize and then how you, you know, really uh, bring about. And in terms of the other question, I'll just repeat it, Girish. I think you were asking about how resilience is built uh, amongst yes. blockchain across how the supply can, chain. How can you improve resilience uh, using, essentially, how does it create visibility and... Uh... Okay, so I think... Uh, uh, I think we've, we've kind of covered, right? I think uh, the, the technology and the platform is evolving today as we, as, uh, as we continue to speak and explore, right? And the second thing that is really, uh, you know, catching up uh, of late is in terms of uh, the appetite for companies and industries to really try out solutions. So even at Ford, we have been trying to build uh, you know, certain solutions around blockchain, uh, around the supply chain space. And we have been, it's, it's been a long journey for us, honestly, because uh, as Rajshri said, uh, there are tons of legacy systems that are running, right? So you're thinking about probably integrating mainframe systems that still run for the last 50, 60 years, right into a completely digital uh, you know, front end framework, uh, which still needs to fetch the same set of data uh, without impacting your legacy system while you are still giving that experience across your supply chain members and your you know partners so it, it requires uh, what we would like to call as thinking and a more of a strategic intent which needs to come more of a top down uh, where the organization also really sees the benefits of blockchain as a solution number one and then in terms of really quantifying those benefits, now that is one of the biggest challenges that everybody is having, right? So we are talking about investments, but the idea of investment is what is going to be the ROI if I'm going to put that money in today. Is it going to be immediate? Is it going to be two, three, four years down the line? And with blockchain, it's at the current state, as we are seeing, it's actually quite difficult to really pin down a number and say, okay, I will be able to do it because it is still evolving as and when you see the ecosystem growing, as and when you see your supply chain ecosystem also participating, that's when you really start seeing the benefits of uh, you know uh, blockchain really coming across. One of the lessons that we have kind of learned as we have understood in terms of how, how the resilience is actually built is, is combining a bunch of things, right? First thing is what your org strategy is with respect to blockchain. Um, second thing is in terms of... Uh, uh, using some of the consortiums that are actually setting standards for blockchain. Rajshri covered about Mobi. Mobi is setting up standards not only for the vehicle identity, but we are working on the part identity as well, right? So today uh, we have a version one of the standard that is published, uh, which is essentially a part identity that allows you to digitize a part on the network and you can track it right from your tire one supplier all the way up to a tire end supplier. So tomorrow, if there is a, let's say if there's a warranty recall, you have, you clearly know where the block is and then you can actually glow and really see which supplier needs an address, you know, first. That is something which is really critical. One another example, which I would like to give you is, especially when you're putting a supply chain or a logistics, uh, you know, network across on a blockchain. One of the common uh, issues that we have often seen is in terms of price variances between what is there in the 
purchase order versus what the customer supplier is actually billing you because the purchase order is not updated for the supplier now if you really think through that in a normal scenario in any organization that is something like a 3 to 4 weeks time for you to identify that there is a typical you know a price variance issue a blockchain allows you to do it instantly because if there is no thing the platform allows you to highlight it it gets the communication out people are involved and they get the you know uh, information across so it 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 allows you that flexibility it allows you that transparency which in itself is actually building resilience because uh, especially the post pandemic world uh, transparency has become more of a uh, requirement rather than something which we were actually aspiring for so the more transparent you are the better it is for the companies to plan your production schedules your you know shipment schedules and it also allows you to plan where your purchase orders are at any point of time and especially when you are getting the suppliers also inside then you get to watch what the supplier stock levels are and based on that you can actually plan around how how you want to spread your risk across the suppliers right so that 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 kind of helps to kind of you know really build and i'll just finish off with what uh, a standards or a framework based approach would to help uh, today everybody every one of us you know seated here we have done our own bit of blockchain pocs but we have not really had a defined standard in terms of saying that this is what we want to do right be it an implementation framework or be it in a uh, or, or on a digital uh, uh, you know or on a digital ledger in terms of you know interoperability between digital ledgers we are not having those standards coming in that's where consortiums like mobi or iota iota and then the transport alliance all those people are actually coming in they are actually establishing they are, they are saying that okay fine you want to get digital here is your path to really take it digital so that kind of you know really helps and finally uh, i think we are looking at blockchain primarily uh, from a process efficiency slash cost savings perspective i think we really need to look at it beyond that process efficiency and cost savings are essentially the first step and if i have to really call it based on the original paper blockchain we really need to see it as an internet of value right not just what we are as oems or as manufacturers or as service providers what are we really getting but then what is it that is for the other stakeholders and the other value partners in the ecosystem that they are actually gaining a supplier getting a quicker payment a supplier getting a bigger transparency of where his goods are right uh, like an ai or uh, an iot integration with your with your shipping containers is really going to help you to plan your production schedules in a much you know better way i know right now in a post covid world we are still recovering but then these are all some of the things that we can really so these things really help you to build those resilience that is actually required and finally if i have to say i think within the organization it needs to be bought in it needs to be bought in as a solution it needs to be bought in as an approach and we should not really say that okay fine we are doing a poc <coughs> excuse me and post the poc we will decide i think we are doing a poc or a prototype because we are seeing value there i think we really need to extrapolate that value and see where value can really add for business thanks thanks to you it was indeed uh, yes uh, also I, i i like that internet of value uh, probably the ecosystem needs to tap into the value that uh, the blockchain based solution can unlock uh, and uh, also create mutually beneficial followers in the supply chain area in terms of visibility in terms of manage of control uh if i could now look at a, a second a third aspect of it which is essentially uh, what are the challenges to prepare for when adopting blockchains uh, based solutions and uh, if i could request uh, ame to come in here uh, ame you have been uh, uh, implementing solutions across organizations for uh, both uh, enterprise rollouts as well as uh, pocs one of the fears that most people have when it comes to a techno a new technology or a novel technology is uh, how can i use it what are there any pit- things that i need to look out for I, do i need to be worrying about something there are some kind of that that kind of a worry which is available with people and also there is some kind of a uh a, a doubt in the mind about the value proposition you can achieve 
from a blockchain. So probably if you could uh, take us through some of your experiences, your thought processes uh, in how uh, enterprises should be looking at this. Sure, Girish, thank you so much for that. Uh, and I appreciate all these speakers before me talking about the real challenges that they are seeing here. Now, just to change the, change the course from the manufacturing side, I also like to bring in the value that we are, we are delivering in the pharma side, right? Pharma supply chain, which is yes. highly regulated and every product is a life-saving product over there. We have done some, some amount of work with oncology drug manufacturers. We've done work with vaccines and that's been that's something we've been talking for a long time about. I would like to put, talk about the challenges that we face in the vaccine side, right? The whole world was looking at vaccines to be available and to be administered at a at a global level, but there's always been a challenge at the infrastructure level. Some of the problems that people do see while implementing something like a blockchain-based solution is the availability of digital records, the availability of data being digital, right? In the vaccine side, yeah, India is much better place than any other country when it comes to infrastructure, and still India saw wastage of up to 37% of vaccines just because of non-visibility of that data immediately. Similarly, if you look at other countries where these vaccines have been implemented, people are not even able to understand what the blockchain is trying to tell them. We have to simplify it to a level that it is only one button or two button on the application so that they understand, okay, this is the insight I'm getting and this is an action that I have to take now. So, so as simple as changing hands, right? Uh, chain of custody, where you change hands of the goods from one party to the other, that has to be simpler, simplified. Then there's another level of challenge that comes into uh, in, into supply chain side that is about having data visibility at an SKU level. So of course, nowadays manufacturers have a batch number that you can trace, but what about the consignments inside the batch? What if that a batch of say 100,000 vaccines is then distributed within a state and from a state to a district, from a district to a hospital? How do you make sure the end level visibility, SKU level visibility comes into picture? That's a big challenge to address. That kind of data should be available somewhere or it has to be initiated by the manufacturer by using something, something like a serialization application, which is where Devaka before my before me talked about having part identity, vehicle identity coming into picture. That's extremely important to be in place before you come to a blockchain. So all in all, my experience has been if you look at a, implementing a blockchain, there has to be three layers that you have to be ready with. One is the digital layer where you have data sets available in some form, in some digital form in, in a legacy system or some other system, then have a layer of visibility that the blockchain application can come into picture. For example, Profil talked about markets in which can come perfectly about this kind of a layer. And then you build additional value proposition uh, applications such as uh, demand forecasting, supply forecasting, taking, uh, taking data from external systems about supply chain disruption and then figuring out, okay, what are, which set of suppliers was actually provide me the goods in the time and, and do I have to take something like an emergency shipment? Should I take an emergency uh, inventory into picture? Those kind of things can come on top of that. So by all in all looking at uh, being ready to implement something like this, you have to be clear that your current prerequisites of data availability should be present in your supply chain system. Thank you, Rohit. Yes, uh, we need to ensure that uh, our existing system also can feed into a blockchain-based solution. And, and, and what you talked about in terms of pharma and vaccine uh, have been one of, uh, India has been fairly successful in limiting the uh, damage, probably thanks to uh, the appropriate use of technology and that we should thank technology also in some way and the technology players for the, having done that. Uh, if I could now bring in um, Tanmay. Tanmay, one of the one of the uh, challenges that also uh, you know, uh, as as a blockchain, it also offers you uh, an ability to track and trace your digital assets. Right. Um, what do you see the evolution? How do you see? Uh, in fact, uh, both uh, Rajshri and uh, uh, I think uh, Ro, uh, I think uh, Divakar both did touch upon uh, you know uh, using blockchain to identify vehicles or even parts if, if that's that's going through that becomes one aspect of uh, you know using blockchain uh, at the same time uh, there is something new which is coming up uh, in terms of al along with blockchain we have the smart contract and. Uh, the current uh, rage, which is the NFT. Uh, how do we use these 
also in our supply chains tanmay if i could have you yeah girish uh, first of all uh, good evening to all the esteemed speakers um yeah so rightly said uh, that uh, this particular technology uh, has to be uh, initially i mean i started my journey from 2017 and uh, what i know about this technology is uh, all those years belong to the developers and then the architects then the product managers and then organizations are following it and believe me or not uh, 2022 2023 is going to be the regulators uh, uh, share of the blockchain and that is when the regulators will be able to party so once the regulators are done we all can party together um but again uh, the basic is the technology has to be perfect right so um now everybody has touched upon um a bit upon or, or maybe have gone to details also uh, of how exactly the technology is working and uh, like i may mentioned that uh, uh, there are there are uh, challenges where you really need to understand uh, what is inside the package right so absolutely the 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 parts uh, parts id a model id everything of the vehicles or the bigger parts is easy to track but what about uh, something like a, like a burger is it a burger or a vada pav how do you know i mean unless you open the package so that kind of technology is something which is missing you can, we can also see that uh, the supply chain network of amazon and flipkart you can see people complaining about the phones being uh, turned into soap so we need to address that as well right so um coming back to your question uh, the smart contracts and the nfts um smart contracts is something which is which is like the brain of blockchain and uh, everything which is uh, which interacts with the ledgers uh, will go through the smart contracts so it can be called in different different names in different different technologies but uh, whole in whole it remains the smart contract right so it's it's what you code so that the data is properly accessed and the data is properly posted into the blockchain digital ledgers which is the databases which which is distributed across right to be to be very simple in terms of what technology speaks right now uh, for the nfts um, i was i was just um, a month ago i was there in the um, dubai conferences and i could see there are thousands of companies working on nfts okay what they do is um they take a particular art uh, or design or a particular moment for example let's say um we we won the world cup 1984 okay so that kind of moment and they they build a picture out of it okay and that particular picture or that particular design uh, they generally uh, they they make it as as a part of the tokens right so they they build it as like a tokens that that particular token remains um, uh, remains uh, valid across the world right so anybody can so what happens in in like digital assets sharing is uh, uh, we we share the digital assets we pay the value for it right similar to that in nfts uh, what happens is you can ask for the ownership of that particular token and you can pay the value for it right so for example let's say an artist designs a particular creation um let's say a remote village in karnataka okay and that has been converted to a token and that particular token uh is been circulated across the world okay and somebody likes it uh, they share it across facebook or or linkedin or wherever it is right so once they share it okay they are not paying the value for it right so if we have the token attached and once it is shared that particular token is attached with whatever is shared and we can track it out that will generate revenue for that particular artist so that is one of the supply chain aspect we can talk about um also uh, what i see is uh, the nfts are are um, Uh, there are there are two parts of it or there is a defi and then there is a nft right so there is a, there is a war between these uh, war of tugs between these two right so who is who is greater who is this decentralized finance or it's a it's a non fungible tokens right so how exactly it is coming into the network is yet to be seen but um, nfts are something which is causing the artists to grow uh, across the network uh, the, across the supply chain network and that's when um, you see the art value increases right so rather than selling the goods 
um, it's it's the it's the intellectual property which is getting getting sold, right? So that's something which is very interesting, uh, and we we really need to uh, rest. I mean, uh, respect this particular things, right? So there are there are stuffs where where we are doing gaming, uh, using blockchain, using using our uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay, there are there are games which has their own cryptocurrencies. Right, so there are there are a number of samples where we can we can uh, function. Uh, from a supply chain perspective, we need to uh, uh, bring in those technologies um, which could set up the last mileage storage. Right, so like I said, right, uh, unless you know uh, whether the packet uh, has a has a burger or a varapa, uh, you will not be able to make out. Right. Okay, there is one more thing which uh, which I don't see many of the blockchain experts are touching into this in the industry. I would I would like to bring it forward for everyone's uh -huh. notice. Is we talk about food to plate, right? So we track the food, we bring it to the plate of the customer, right? So once the food is eaten, okay, what happens to that particular data? There is a whole lot of linked list or the linked data which has got formed because of the history of the food tracing. Now, what happens when the food is eaten? Okay, how do you how do you maintain that particular data? Do you really let go of the entire history and build only one particular set, saying that this particular set or this particular row will be used for any further uh, data analytics? Right now, having a history of the linked lists is increasing the load on the infrastructure. Right, so the databases are are really ramped up and you need to really do uh, indexing and, and stuff like that, right? So we need to touch upon that. And uh, yeah, so I, I will take a pause over here uh, in case there is something else which can come up and I can answer it over. That's an interesting question. What do we do with the digital uh, data that we have created uh, uh, through our efforts and how do we tap into this? Um, there's one question which has come up from one Sham Singh. Uh, I, I believe what he wants to, I, I, it's, it's a slightly longish question. I think what he wants to uh, suggest is that there are many companies who are working on soil testing, crop suggestions, et cetera. Uh, and how do we uh, improve the adaptable, adoptability of such technologies on the last mile? Uh, Probably if uh, anyone of you could take it. So uh, if I may, so yeah. basically the question is actually the part of a larger ecosystem of questions like what are inherent challenges? So this is again, one of the typical uh, challenge of agri value chains. Now, a large part of agri value chain is still unorganized, right? There are farmers, then there are, uh, say, labor contractors, ground level logistic people uh, who act inherently provide a lot of value, bring a lot of value to this complete agri value chain, moving, growing goods, um, uh, agri produce, then moving agri produce from, say, farm to warehouse, then from warehouse to plant. So most of them are unorganized. So, which uh, essentially uh, makes it very challenging to embed them. Uh, to any blockchain continuum if you are uh, making it, right? Uh, second uh, critical challenge is uh, now uh, most of the agri value chain is not untouched by say government bodies or quasi government departments. Uh, I'll give you a small example. For example, any agri has to suffer mandi fees, right? Somewhere. It is a very important transaction of entire agricultural transaction. They, they, they you know, onboarding them itself is very challenging, right? Uh, what is their level of preparedness and readiness to come? And I mean, part of a semi-private, semi-public blockchain. Uh, uh, I mean, third thing is then these are numerous stakeholders. Then, in fact, in organizations themselves, uh, there are so many digital systems uh, are working in isolation. For example, there could be a freight optimizer. There could be a backend like SAP. Then there could be uh, 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 AI or ML based uh, of uh, price forecaster. Now, everything has to be part of the seamless digital continuum. So interoperability amongst the different internal ecosystems of any organization uh, itself is very challenging. Forget about the external part of it. Now coming to that question. Yes, it is very important. There is a great uh, potential of uh, uh, applying a lot of IoT based technologies at grassroots level, say in terms of thermometers, uh, drones, 
which can actually help uh, in uh, precision agriculture. That exactly is the plan for Agri 3.0 revolution. And uh, once that would be done, of course, uh, uh, they have to be part of a larger uh, uh, digital ecosystem. And uh, now how it can be done, I think uh, now, uh, while a lot of agri-tech startups have already taken a lead, a lot many agri-food companies are also trying their best to do pilots now. It is uh, only a matter of time when this technology will catch up and uh, uh, the value uh, which would get generated, uh, say in terms of improvement in yields, improvement in quality, uh, complete traceability. So, I mean, when, when all these things will uh, get accomplished, uh, definitely uh, the usage and adoption, adop adoption would uh, uh, Thank you. substantially increase. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I could just have, uh, you know, we, I think we have come almost to the end of the uh, session. If I could have a quick uh, wrap, a uh, quick one uh, minute kind of uh, summation from Rajshri uh, on your final thoughts in terms of what would you, what would be your word of advice for people who are looking for solutions in blockchain? See, like um, I just give in case study within the automobile industry and told which are the companies who have been adapting to the technology, yes. right? Uh, but if you look at it, it's not, uh, we have not completely adapted because like, you know, there are a lot of legacy systems. There are also still uh, a big challenge when people are not forthcoming to, you know, try and test the new, um, you know, the emerging technologies because the data privacy and security is a big, big concern. But today, whether anybody likes it or not, the trans the digital transformation is something which is all based on the open innovation, partnership and collaborations. So if we want to, you know, um, like three important things which the business um, focuses in achieving, right? One is increased productivity and efficiency, cost reduction and value and impact to not just the business, but the customers. We need to be uh, doing things faster and quicker. It's like you test, um, you fail fast, you learn and you move on. But if you kind to resist the transformation or the change, we'll be left behind. I know that that's the uh, challenge. And even if you look at just the uh, automobile industry in the last two years, an example in Germany, now the, due to the disruption in the supply chain, they have started uh, not depending, you know, the kind of model they had. So they're trying to diversify the supply chain base itself. So which means there is going to be too many transformations that is actually happening. So in order to, you know, manage all of this, we have to, you know, adapt to the open innovation model. Until we don't have this open innovation model, it's always going to be a challenge. Um, even with respect to, you know, uh, Daimler, they even uh, actually adapted a partnership collaboration, whether even it be, be even say, for example, uh, BMW itself. So they were collaborating with Daimler on trying something different so that where you're using the knowledge and the best practices, what each of us have been able to achieve in our own field. And how do you bring the best of, you know, uh, best of everything and leverage that knowledge so that we all can journey in our own world. So it's it's all about open innovation and it's all about partnerships and collaboration. Thanks, thanks. Wonderful input. I think that's also that. Uh, uh, I think what you said really, really makes makes sense in terms of you try, you fail, you pick yourself up and move ahead, and don't uh, uh, don't get stuck in that failure mode. And I think that's something that as uh, uh, for something which has got such a novel in a way novel um, idea like a blockchain and specifically whose uh, enterprise rollouts have yet to be seen in countries like India, where there are ecosystem challenges and infrastructure challenges. I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. And I think that at the end of the day would be the takeaway that all of us need to have is that, yes, this is a technology whose time has come. This is a technology that we need to explore. This is a technology which we should not be scared of. And it, yes, it is an era of uh, open innovation and collaboration. Uh, if that is the case, then there is no other option but for us to embrace this technology and move forward and not get worried about, uh, you know, a lot of us do a, a proof of concept and we leave it at the proof of concept and then go to the next proof of concept. I think somewhere we need to bite the bullet and say, yes, I have done the proof of concept. I need to get into the technology because the problems of not using the technology are far more challenging than you know, implementation of the challenge of this technology, which might have some problems. I think that would be the underlying note with which uh, 
I would like to close the sessions today. I thank you all for taking your time off, especially Rajeshri, Ame, Panme, Divakar, and Rohit. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking time off and uh, sharing your views with our audience. I also th am thankful to uh, Coinart for uh, uh, being a partner with us in this journey. Uh, we hope to have you on with us for other such journeys also. And yes, we. this is just the first, as I said before, this is just the first of the uh, five technology initiatives that we are having. We are looking at control towers. We are looking at AIML. We are looking at uh, uh, mapping. We, we, we are looking at every bit of technology that is available to us. And we started with blockchain. I hope this discussions have uh, opened up some thought processes within our minds so that we could um, go on to the from the proof of concept, let's move up, let's step up, and let's embrace change. Let's be live, let's live that openness and innovation and collaboration that Rajshri talked about. Thank you very much. Uh, I also thank uh, Team ISCM, uh, specifically Rupali, for having worked uh, behind the scenes in putting this up together. Uh, Yvonne for providing timely assistance in terms of technology and uh, being there to solve all our problems and the entire marketing team of uh, the Institute of Supply Chain Management too and forums to make this a grand success. Thank you all. And I hope to see you in larger numbers for the next episode of us, which will be um, on um, control tasks. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.